And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from Polyhedra Games, and is, current, and is currently developing Nebula Chaos, which we'll be getting into tonight. The one and only Clipper Arnold. How you doing today, man? Or good, how are you? Happy to be here. I'm good. Good riddance to summer. Now I can actually get some decent weather before winter comes. Yeah, I walked around outside. It's still a little sticky out there. But, um, you know, Halloween's coming up. One of the one of those holidays that I'm technically banned from. <laughs> Why is that? Because one year, a few years ago, I tr I tricked a bunch of people into getting into eating sugar free candy by swap by swapping the um wrappers. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that and the time I hand that and the time the times that I've handed out big Hershey bars, but it's a but it's actually unsweetened chocolate bars. Oh, okay. <laughs> I figured I'd put the trick back in trick-or-treating. Yeah, have you ever had unsweetened chocolate? I mean, I guess so, if you're talking about it. Uh, I have a chocolate allergy. I know that unsweetened chocolate is very bitter, but I, I literally cannot have chocolate. Oh, really? I've never heard that. I mean, I'm sure you do, but... It's yeah, that's, that's it's never occurred to me. It's the bean that messes with me. Oh, okay. Also, have you ever seen how chocolate is made? Because it's pretty wild. It looks I like have. weird little alien beans or whatever. I have. It is much less traumatizing than seeing how sausage is made. Okay, fair enough. So, I like to start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, geez. Um, well, uh, I've probably been playing role-playing games since I was about 10 years old. So this is about 20 years ago. Um, I kind of came into it through, like, video games originally, and just, you know, friends that I had as kids, and, like, seeing it um, in, like, various places. Like, you know, we played, like, Diablo, and... Um, some other games that were like adapted from uh tabletop rpgs in a sense um and like i remember reading uh i had like two or three issues of shonen jump and one of those issues had uh like a Yu-Gi-Oh chapter where they were playing like a tabletop rpg yeah i, I remember like that, that chapter um takahashi god rest his soul was a was a big D and D nut, and it really comes through in his monster designs in the manga. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, we uh, I think we kind of like tried playing some like primitive forms of like role playing games, just with like dice and like like a handful of stats. Uh, but then my first experience with a tabletop RPG was actually. Star Wars West End Games D6, I want to say. Probably when I was, like, about 10 or 11. Like, at one of my friend's birthday parties. And then, um... Around the same time, like, my friends were really into Warcraft. So we played the Warcraft adaptation of D&D 3.5. Mm -hmm. Um, that was actually before WoW came out. Uh, which is pretty wild to think about. Um, and then we also played D&D 3.5 regular... Um, and then, ever since then, it's been kind of like a Pandora's box. Um, I played it quite a bit up through high school, and then during high school, I think I was, I had this idea that I was too cool for role-playing games, um, and didn't really get back into it in college. Uh, but that was about the time that, you know, I really got into, like, uh, a lot more vintage stuff, and started building my own RPG systems, and, um... You know that sort of thing. So, yeah, everybody has that phase where they where they try and build a better D and D. 
Oh, yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, I don't know how many people build a better D and D. I'm um, I'm being I'm being facetious. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I think it depends on what you want to play, right? Like, I think D&D is fine. I think the different versions serve different purposes. But, you know, um, I think there are plenty of other games that serve plenty of other purposes. And I think the general public is um, very much only aware of the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. Because, you know, that's the big guy that everyone knows. So, mm-hmm. And... And yeah, yeah, and I've I've been cr- I've been critical of how people treat the big how people treat the big guy while at the same time claiming that they're fans of T- of TTRPGs, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, but given that given that this is the given that um Nebula Chaos is the se- is the second um project un- under the Polyhedra um system. I would like to talk a bit about Justice Velocity, which I remember. I, pro- I probably should have. I probably should have reached out to you when that when that came out, but I hadn't really set things up at at the time the way I have now. Um, was Justice Velocity your fir- your first attempt at trying to at trying to make your own thing? How did how did that come about? Yeah, so it's actually basically. During college, like when I was getting back into RPGs, we were playing a lot of things, but a lot of the friends who I had that were really into like trying it out had never like had a lot of experience with tabletop RPGs before. Um, and they were like kind of green and casual. Mm-hmm. So I kind of um put together a system that was kind of more like lightweight. You can make characters really quickly, and it could move pretty quickly. It's a 2D6 system, so, you know, you didn't have to figure out what all the different polyhedral dice were. Um, But yeah, it was basically just, the system, the base system was probably, I've been working off of Nanon for about 10 years or so. Um, And that is, the first game that we played with that was actually called Death City, which will be released in the future, but that was... It's never actually been released, and that's sort of more like an urban fantasy, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, uh, you know, a Hellboy type of thing. So there's like demons and vampires and ghosts and stuff like that, and sort of like a cyberpunk light city. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we were playing with, we played that for like a few years, um, and Justice Velocity was sort of born out of, I went to go see one of the movies in theaters. I think it was the seventh one. And um, my friends and I drank a lot of margaritas one of what and then went say. into the theater. And uh, my friend had showed me like an action movie name generator that was like generated. It was like an AI had generated a bunch of these absurd action movie titles. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the names was Justice Velocity. And I just thought that was such like an absurd, amazing title for an action movie. So then, you know, when I saw uh, the Fast and Furious movie in theaters, the whole time I was watching it, I was kind of like thinking how I could translate that into a tabletop RPG. So I used this base system that we'd been using for a while, and I kind of cobbled together a rule set, and we did play tests on that. Um, and then a couple of years later, I ended up writing up the whole thing, getting some design feedback, and making it the first published product. Um, and the big thing with Justice Velocity 2 was like um, focusing on vehicle mechanics, especially. Like a lot of the game, like every session of Justice Velocity, you're not going to be doing. Uh, you know, chase sequences or races or anything like that, but the uh, they're there for when those situations arise. Um, and it was also kind of a design challenge because typically, right, vehicle mechanics in tabletop RPGs are vastly, like, you know, they're not done well. They're kind of tacked on as an afterthought, typically. So they end up being, like, overly complicated and people just kind of, like, do their own stuff whenever the situation arises. Or... It doesn't have enough enough depth to actually, you know, make it move how you want it to. It's, so that was kind of the impetus behind that, but yeah. It's meant to 
I think it's meant. I think it's meant to fulfill the action movie fantasy. But the problem is, a lot of t- a lot of times, it um it either get it either gets in the way or doesn't have much thought. I think the only pr- there's only a handful of there's only a handful of um games and game devs I can think of that have given it yep. a further amount of thought. One of them being the chase rules in Spycraft 2.0. I'm so glad you said that because I was literally just about to say Spycraft is like the one that probably does it right. But the the other one is is just the general vibe within um within feng shui. But yeah. that's because that's because Robin Laws is somebody who is a is a massive movie buff. In fact, he wrote the book um, "Blowing Up the Movies." Yeah, I actually haven't played Feng Shui, but I like what I've seen of it. Um, and it does seem very close to Justice Velocity as well. Um, Spycraft, yeah, they definitely took quite an eye to the vehicle rules. Though I will say they are a little bit uh, compli- more complicated than like Justice Velocity. It's, it's a little, um, you know, there's like cards and stuff like that. Uh, but I will say, it's there is I, you have other, to appreciate. There is, one like other, the, um, there is one other one I can think of that kind of used cards for his chase rules, but not really. Well, at least not, at least I used it. I used them because of how it's set up, and that is Haven City of Violence in its original form. Late, um, later on, it would get, it would get converted to D twenty Modern, which. Okay, okay, but but D twenty modern is a case of been there, done that, and I, I don't like the vehicle rules in D twenty modern. I don't think anybody does. Yeah, it's tough, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and and that's kind of the thing too. Like you know, with Spycraft, I think those are great rules. Um, and like, there's a lot of vehicular based games in general, like uh, Car Wars, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, or there's there's quite a few others. Um, the name's escaping me at the time, but the that Runehammer guy, I think his name is, he has like some really cool tabletop game that's like vehicle based. Um, but yeah, I mean, our focus was pretty much on making like a pseudo simplified modular system so that you could still keep an action movie pace going and keep dice rolling, but you know, have enough depth there in order to. Uh, you know, do what you want to do. So I would say we kind of hit that sweet spot or try to hit that sweet spot rather um, between, we call it like cinematic tabletop role playing. Mm -hmm. So it's not really like rules light per se, but it's not like super granular. Um, It's the emphasis is really like quick comic booky action and, um, you know, giving people enough to make a good game and make a good narrative, but not too much to where it's like uh, overloading people. You know, that's that's where we try to be. But yeah, and with the now with that in mo- with that in mind, I do remember I do remember when I went through Justice Velocity, which I was I I had gotten dangerously close to doing a to doing a um campaign that was heavily inspired by the Expendables. Okay. Um, sure. It was just that ti- timing and my own and my own writer's block didn't made it so that it didn't quite pan out. Um, because the ins- the there were three things that were inspirations for me with that with that idea. One of them was the A Team. One of them was the Expendables, and one of them was the trailer for Overstrike, the game that would eventually become. Um, fuse and is considered one of the biggest missed opportunities. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Um, this looks cool though. Fuse was just meh, and it's and it's been since treated as an ex- as a case study in how not to use focus testing. <laughs> this was also during that everything has to everything has to be modern and gritty um, boner during the seventh generation, which was unfortunate. Especially yeah, coming this... from a studio like Insomniac, and since, and given what they've done with Spider-Man and Sunset Overdrive, I think they've they've admitted that they backed the wrong horse. Yeah, Sunset Overdrive, what a fucking amazing game, dude! <laughs> like, oh my god, um, Spider-Man too. Yeah, yeah, but but 
the the idea with it was was the PCs being me being members of this elite task of this elite task force, the best of the best in their particular fields. But these get but they're but the but the team themselves they're not the ones who are who are going to be on the posters. They're the misfits, the loose cannons, the pe the people who have re the people who have the unfortunate kinds of kinds of records, despite how well they get things done. Yeah, this sounds like a great setup. So what went wrong, is my question. Writer's block at the time. Oh, okay. That, that and I, I was, I was laid, I was laid out for like two, for like a week and a half when I got really sick. It was, it wasn't COVID. This was years before that, but I, I don't, but I, end, I ended up getting a bet. I, I think I ended up getting a bad case of food poisoning at that time, and it just did, it just didn't work out. I still had, and of course, then then my old computer went kaput, and I ended up losing the notes, and that just killed my vibe. Oh yeah, no, that's understandable. I was more so asking what went wrong with the the video game that we were oh, talking about. Oh, when it came to when it came to Overstrike. Yeah. Well, there was originally the teaser for what was, for that for that name, and they did a presentation. Then apparently it apparently the focus test had had said that it would be a game that would be good for their little br for their little brother and they pivoted towards towards a more gritty towards a more gritty approach where everybody had some sort of baggage and it wasn't the it was and because of that the game what was was essentially trying to have the elements of what came before but trying to go more cod or gears with it yeah, I see that. that work. It looks kind of like Gears of War, but with like, uh, but like modern, right? And also has sort of like this fantasy star of online kind of character design. If they, had I don't know. With the, if they had gone with the more cartoonish approach, I think it would have done better. But that's not what they did, and I think they regret that they that they that they went the route that they did. Yeah, I could see that. Oh. But I I remember I remember looking at it and and thinking and thinking that it that there was some some very some very in, some very interesting ide ideas and th and those ideas I wanted to take plus I always like giving my players very very powerful but very um, unsafe weapons and items. Yeah. <laughs> um. It's because I ha I've had way too much fun with uh, with players when I give them something that that's basically a reskinned version of the noisy cricket from Men in Black, for instance. Hell yeah. Um, there was a Shadowrun campaign once where I get where I decided to take the concept of the ridiculous rifle known as the Fat Mac and make it a semi-automatic rifle. That that um you had to be a troll in order to use, otherwise it was it would probably kill you with all the recoil. And if you've if you've ever seen what a fat what a fat mac looks like, you'll know why, you'll know why. Oh okay. I'm not familiar with that. I am familiar with the the cricket from Men in Black though. Yeah. The fat. And I've I've referenced the Fat Mac in in jokes in, in the past, but um, it is chambered in not it is chambered in 950 JDJ, which is about which is about which is ridiculously big. Um, just I uh, just I just sent you a visual example just so you know how how, how ridiculous it is, and the, and the, and on the same table is the bullet. Wow. Yeah, that's big. And then the what the the end of that looks like a soda can size thing, you know? Well, because of how much powder you're dealing with, you kind of ha you kind of have to. And this is technically considered a hunting rifle. I will let that <laughs> I, I will give you a moment to let that sink in. I don't know what you hunt with this. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would probably like exploded deer mm -hmm. you know um i don't think this i don't think this is meant for deer i think this is meant for things like boar or or rhinos or or the like something where you something where you need a whole lot a whole lot more um powder because 
shoot because shoot because um the tough skin is going to be harder to penetrate and if the and if you're dealing with something that's charging you're going to need something that's going to stop that momentum so that even if you kill it it doesn't run you over because it's going at full speed mm -hmm. a charging rhino doesn't stop as soon as that something that's going that fast isn't going to just stop if it's dead it's still it's still going to be sliding because it's still got too much energy but when it now what i did something i did find kind of amusing with when i was going through the material you had sent for um for nebula chaos is is some of the inspirations that you mentioned because there's there's not there's not a lack of variety cuz you cuz even on the kickstarter page you mentioned things like star wars firefly mass effect Halo, Futurama, Dune, Starship Troopers, Fantasy Star, Cowboy Bebop, yeah. Saga, Space Met, not space, not space Metal, Space Riders, Heavy Metal, and Star Frontiers. That's that's all. I get the feeling you were somebody who ju who just dived headfirst into science fiction at an early age. Yeah, I mean, I think that list is just all the stuff that I think is cool. Oh. Um. So, uh, yeah, and that all pops up in Nebula Chaos in one way or another. Because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was sort of the impetus behind Nebula Chaos as well, which is um, when I first moved to New York a few years ago, I was just doodling up, you know, a bunch of, like, little aliens and spaceships and stuff while I was on the subway. And um, I kind of wanted to integrate that into, like, a sci-fi space opera game. And I started looking into some systems, uh, wondering what I could play that would fit comfortably with everything. But um, from the material that was out there, it didn't... I couldn't really quite find anything that hit all the right notes that I wanted it out, of it, out of things. So, like, I wanted it to play quickly. Um, I wanted, like, quick place, quick paced space combat. I wanted to be able to use all my weird, goofy, homebrew aliens. Um, and, you know, in light of not being able to find uh, something that hit all those right chords, I was just like, okay, well, I already have a system. I might as well just take the dive and do this. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of where it started. Um, and I just took... Justice Velocity and reskinned it essentially, just in a similar way how Justice Velocity was a reskin of Death City before it. And so in that regard, it uses the same core system. It retains a lot of the similar vehicle rules, except now there's going to be new rules for like spaceships and space battles and stuff like that. Um, but you still get cool stuff like chase sequences and races and things like that. Um, and, you know, it's quick, quick paced, easy to make characters. So people don't get too bogged down trying to make player characters or trying to make NPCs or enemies and stuff like that. And it's kind of built in a way where it shines best as like one shots or short campaigns. But that being said, I've also run like there's a campaign of Justice Velocity that I'm in now that's like 60 sessions deep, if not more. Um, I've run maybe like... 10 sessions of Nebula Chaos mm -hmm. for play testing that was like, uh, you know, uh, a bit longer than what I imagine a lot of campaigns would be for this. Um, but then I've also run like shorter campaigns too, like one shots or like a few games here and there. So, mm -hmm. and now it seems a lot of games have some sort of extra effort um, system, which is my nickname for. Things for things like action points in D and D four E, fortune in Warhammer, um, Moxie in Eclipse Phase, and willpower in World of Darkness. If I'm if unless I'm mistaken, your equivalent is chaos tokens. Yeah, so that's I would say that's pretty similar. Like basically, once per session, everyone gets a chaos token. And that's sort of, like, supposed to be for your big moment in the game. Like, whenever you need to do a backflip over 
a bunch of bad guys and spray down a hail of bullets and you want to make sure that your big cool move succeeds or you know if you're blasting through an asteroid belt just as it's closing you know you might need that little bit extra to get it going so that's what the chaos token is for oh uh, now given that given that fantasy star was one of your was one of the things you referenced um before I get into this question, I do I do want to ask: Were you in, were you introduced to Fantasy Star through the Genesis games or through online? Uh, actually, so I actually the first Fantasy Star game I played was PSO on Dreamcast, and then later on GameCube. But I didn't actually use the online component. We just played like split screen with my friends when I was a kid, Which um, is and then. <laughs> Side note: Sorry, it's a bit, ahead, it's yeah. a bit amusing um, that you that you mentioned Diablo early on because um, the creator of PSO outright admitted that Diablo was one of the influences. Okay, that yeah, that does not surprise me at all. <laughs> you know, like a looter, you know, uh, third-person action RPG mm -hmm. that tracks easy. But yeah, and then after that, you know, I played. Um, some of the Genesis games, and uh, I played a couple of the PSP games like recently, actually. But I really just like the design in those games, mm -hmm. um, and it's a very unique take on sci-fi because it's like it's really cool and stylized and goofy, and like I think that's kind of a part of the Nebula Chaos ethos as well. Like basically. I think there's plenty of other games that give you that like hard sci-fi with the crunch and like the realistic space elements, but I just wanted to make something kind of like left field. Um, and I think I've said this before, um, probably in a couple of other interviews uh, in regards to Justice Velocity or in regards to Nebula Chaos, but I think there's like for me, right, a big kick that I get out of tabletop RPGs is like you know, just hanging out with your friends, having a few beers, getting some good jokes in, and, um, you know, telling, like, a cool story and being empowered by your creativity. And um, I just... The way that we make games is trying to package that experience for other people uh, in hopes that they get to do the same. And I think there's a certain bit of... Um, I don't know, like, uh, humor and, like, style, I think, goes a long way in, in like, visual language and in the writing of setting a sort of precedent for people that, um, th it kind of opens this door that they don't have to take their role-playing too seriously, like, they can make it what they want, like, obviously you can play it seriously if there are serious moments or you want to play a serious campaign, sure, but, like, I don't, I think it makes it less intimidating and like more approachable for people if that makes sense mm -hmm. but the what i was going to ask is in is i have because i had i had my fair share of experiences up and down with with playing a force character the the adva the advanced or in some cases broken archetype and I'm, I'm. If somebody wanted to do, we uh, a, still here. I'm still here. What I was curious about is, if somebody wanted to do the equi the equivalent of, of a for of a force type, you know, like the forces in, P in PSO, um. How would they? How would they go about that? Because I'm pretty sure that question is going to get asked. Uh, yeah. You mean like basically like a mage or like a Jedi or type of thing? Some something something in that realm. If 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 I have to use the example in Mass Effect, obviously biotic, um, or psychers in for, in 40k. You know that something something in that ballpark. Yeah, so there's quite a bit of psionics in here. Um, some of it needs a bit more, like, mechanical love and statting out. Um, but yeah, there's, like, telekinesis, there's uh, pyrokinesis, cryokinesis, terrakinesis, electrokinesis, uh, levitation, 
you know, uh, like a lot of stuff like that. Basically, so the whole gist behind character creation is it's a classless system. Mm-hmm. So everyone, typically, it's a uh, point by, but you can also do randomized. You can make it a higher or lower level, depending on if your characters are just like little grunts or if they're, you know, Olympian it's, level superheroes or whatever. It There's sounded like the term that you scale. use is tier. Am I correct? Um, let me check. Kind of. Let me double check. Uh, I don't know if that's the terminology that we use for character creation specifically. We do use tiers for like um, abilities and weapons and items mm-hmm. in character creation. Uh, low level to average, and then we have normal heroic, and then we have high level. Um, and yeah, like I said, you could do allocation or random or like a combination of both, but basically, so like for the default setting for Nebula Chaos, you get 20 stat points and 10 ability points. The 20 stat points are broken up into, uh, power, dexterity, personality, will, and intelligence. And those are basically your default modifiers. So you'll roll 2d6 and then add your power if you're trying to like lift a heavy object or make a melee attack or something like that and so on and so forth for the other uh base stats um and then your hp energy points and are and your movement are all uh based off of those base stats so basically that's where it starts you break up your 20 points and then you have 10 points from that to make the rest of your character and with those 10 points you can buy uh, what are called skill specialties, abilities, or traits. Uh, skill specialties just give you a bonus for, like, if you're particularly persuasive or particularly perceptive, you get a plus two to your roll um, in addition to, you know, your base stat and your 2d6. Mm-hmm. If you, uh, whereas abilities are kind of, you know, that's where, like, your superpowers come in. Like, if you take cryokinesis, you know, you're going to be spending your ability points on uh, buying the cryokinesis ability or, like, higher tiers of the cryokinesis ability. But you can also mix and match. Like, you can have a buff guy who knows some cryokinesis or, you know, you can have, like, a very persuasive gunslinger or uh, stuff like that. Um, It's basically made to be a quick and simple system so that you can make like whatever you want with it. Um, and then some abilities are passive or active, right? Like some of them you use in combat, some of them you use for uh, interpersonal interactions. And then uh, the last one is traits, which is actually new in Nebula Chaos from Justice Velocity. Um, and these might be recognizable to people who have played other tabletop systems, but it's basically like you can get extra AP by taking like a negative trait or you can um spend ap to get like a particularly cool trait so for example i'll just pull up a couple of those here uh so like a common trait would be like people take like weakness to poison which gives you like a two extra ap to spend at character creation Or um, another cool one, a lot of people took this in my PvP game that I'm running, it's called Cheat Death, which is whenever you might be killed or KO'd, you roll a dice, and if you get a 5 or 6, you're still standing, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you spend like 2 AP on that. But basically, yeah, you um, to sum it all up, there's a baseline level of stats that you're going to be adding for any check. Um, and then you can take some traits or buy some cool abilities. And usually, like I said, that make, that might take like 10, 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes tops, maybe if people are talking through it. Um, but it's meant to move pretty quickly because, uh, anything that gets people to the table and rolling their first check is kind of like where the magic happens, I think. Um, and then, of course, AP is also... We, there's no, like, experience point system. Mm-hmm. Usually, you'll, like, reward AP uh, every session or every couple of sessions for people to, like, quote-unquote, level up with, um, where you can, like, expand your abilities, get new skills, and stuff like that. And then past that, of course, um, 
you uh, have various items, weapons, and equipment that you can get. Usually for character creation, I usually just do like, you know, uh, get one one tier weapon and one defensive uh, item that's at the first tier. Maybe get two miscellaneous items that are tier one or two. And then, you know, like that type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I can I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that. Um Now with that in with that in mind, there is one big old elephant in the room that is, that has decided to crash on my couch once again. <laughs> and I say once again because I keep using that phrase even though I don't tr I don't try and go out of my way to do it. But if we're if we're talking about doing a space opera RPG, we have to talk about ships. Of course, absolutely. <laughs> so, first things first. Is ship creation not that far removed from character creation? Uh, it's a little bit different. It's kind of more like for anyone who is familiar with Justice Velocity, it's a lot similar to the vehicles in Justice Velocity. Um, there's no specific point buy. Uh, it's just kind of like pre-generated vehicles, but you could obviously make your own from the examples there. I think in Justice Velocity, there was like... So in the Quick Start rules, there's a starting adventure, and with that adventure, players kind of like trick out their own vehicles with like a point buy system. So that might be something actually to include in the final version now that you mention it. Yeah. Uh, but as it stands in the alpha, they're just uh, pre-built. Um, and uh, the idea being that people can use those or build similar things based on the skeletal structure there. Uh, but they basically are... Um, how do I put this? So let's just take a look at the stats here. So the at a basic level... The starships are broken up into small, medium, or large vehicles, and small refers to anything from like a hoverboard, a hovercraft, or a small starfighter. Uh, a medium craft is like a carrier or like a traveling starship that can carry like smaller craft. Mm -hmm. And then large encompasses anything from like large destroyers to capital ships and space stations. Um, and that's just sort of like mechanically to keep things quick and easy. Uh, and moving in that direction, um, just to give people like a general idea of scale. Um, and then as far as the stats go, they're mostly composed of uh, how many health points they have, how much their acceleration is, how much steering they have, if they have any uh, boost abilities, if they have any damage reduction from shields, and then just their weapon systems and upgrades, basically. And weapon systems are like turrets and missiles, bombs stuff like that so yeah so i'm i'm guessing in this kind of classification a small ship would be something like a vi would be something like a viper um a medium sh i'd say a viper or possibly the swordfish um a medium ship would be something like f the serenity or the bebop yeah and mm -hmm. a lot a um a large ship would be a f would be a full on a full on um battleship yeah i I'd, I'd say that's pretty much nailed it um, and there's stuff in between but you know whatever fits those classifications is you know what that's supposed to be there for has and has anyone asked you about has anyone asked you about where where on that um size category um a mech suit would be because <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to bring a if um if we're gonna bring up the mobile infantry from Starship Troopers, we have to bring up the armored infantry as well. Yeah. Uh. So no one's worded it in those terms, but people have asked me if there's power armor in this game, right? Um, which was an interesting question. Uh. So there's power armor in the sense that you can make like a, you know, like an armored galactic marine or halo guy or doom guy or whatever um but there isn't like mech uh there aren't mech suits in the base rules as of yet i actually in 
in this game that I'm playing of Nebula Chaos, which is like a round robin GM type of scenario, I'm actually playing a mecha pilot, uh, like a scrappy junkyard fighter mecha pilot. Uh, but I don't have my mech yet because of just where we are narratively speaking. Um, so I'm mostly just being used as a pilot. So uh, that being said, yes, you can make mecha. Uh, they're not in the core rules as of yet. I was actually planning on doing perhaps like a small expansion for mecha rules specifically. Um, but yeah, uh, on this scale, I'm not sure. They'd probably be medium, I would think, right? I would... I would say I would say it ultimately depends on what on what you mean by mecha. Um, if you're if you're talking, because like j just look at the mechs in say BattleTech, and you've got a wide variety of sizes. You've got tiny boys like the er like the like the meme that is the urban mech, and you and you've got the big boys like an at like an Atlas or a um, Mad Cat. I know those are the obvious examples, but just to de just to demonstrate um, sizes, there's four size categories usually with um, or with um, BattleTech, which is l which is um, light, medium, heavy, and assault. Yeah, so I would say uh, if I'm just speculating here, they'd probably be either small to medium, and my thinking on that is sort of like, okay, so like Voltron, right? five ships in one mm -hmm. the power rangers uh mech is uh five smaller vehicles in one so it has to have the capacity to carry smaller vehicles but right like each of those uh individual vehicles are also smaller by comparison right and probably about the size of like a small starfighter yeah so just spitballing here but that would probably be about it and then you know if you have this like giant you know galactus size mech or whatever that would probably be the large category mm -hmm. but or like I, i'm trying to think of a mech that is that size macross let me let me uh let me google this real quick <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling up one of those charts it's like mech size comparison um the if you want so, if you want something that big you could also uh, the Wow, AT-ATs are huge. Gundams are 18 meters. AT-ATs are 22.5. You could always go you could always go with the Imperator Titans from 40k if you want a mech that's ridiculously huge. Oh, okay. Yeah, that would probably fit the bill. Big boys. Um oh. And those oh, are these are the giant Citadel mechs? Yeah. They are a castle with legs. <laughs> oh, I guess one thing I should mention for the listeners, too, is uh, to be forthcoming here, I, the spaceship rules are actually undergoing a really big rewrite right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of... I made it really simple at first, and then I made it really complicated. And right now it's in the process of getting scaled back from uh, complicated to not as complicated. And this is kind of the approach that I took with Justice Velocity, was like um, just sort of trying out a bunch of things and seeing what, wo what works. And then what did work, we just kind of streamlined and made it into like modular sort of sequences. So that's kind of where we're at with uh, the spaceship rules. Um, a lot of the more complex rules, I think we are going to keep as optional rules if people want to run, you know, like grid-based miniature combat. Um, a lot of that will still be in there. But for the people who are just doing like theater of the mind, um, you know, quick-paced kind of combat, we want to kind of streamline it as, uh, as much as possible to not overcomplicate things. So it's going to be like a good mixture of both, depending on what people's play style is and how they want to run the game. I, um, I can get that. Yeah, because that was kind of one of the things too. Like, uh, you know, like I like quick pace games, but I also like games with a lot of strategic depth. And sometimes there are trade offs, right? On the more gran granular you get with the system, a lot of times. 
uh, the more difficult it becomes to like set up and play and get other people to understand. Um, but I do think that there's uh, people that, that do appreciate that level of granularity, or at least a certain degree of granularity, mm -hmm. uh, to where it's not a huge impediment in their games, but they get to do um, you know, cool like tactical combat and stuff like that. So that's kind of uh, what we're aiming to strike for. So mm -hmm. giving the quick and easy rules for people who don't want to work too hard for their fun, and then also you know, adding in some of the more complex miniatures rules if people are so inclined to play it that way. So, which I I can get I can get. Um, not too long ago, I covered Coriolis, and the ship rules with that have different ship roles played by different player characters. Um, when it comes when it comes to when it comes to doing the ship thing, do you have? Do you plan on having it where the, where there are different roles so that no, so that the the um do, the action pool for things like ship combat aren't aren't be aren't being monopolized by one person? Yeah. So with all vehicle rules in this system, um, it's based off of uh, combat actions and also out of combat actions. So just to back up real quick. We have, uh, let me pull up the combat section so I'm not misquoting anything. But basically, um, in any particular sequence, players get two actions in combat. Mm -hmm. And with those two actions, they can do uh, any of the following uh, twice. They can attack or make a called shot. They can use an ability that doesn't deal damage. Uh, or move, or use an item, throw an item, make a brief statement, pass, etc. Uh, they just can't attack or use an ability that deals damage twice. But the, you can only do that once per turn. But every other action, you can do twice. Mm -hmm. um, so with that being said, uh, typically in like vehicle setups, so like right in Justice Velocity, you have like someone who's driving. Um, so they have to use one of their actions to drive, uh, but then for their other action, they can do things like look for shortcuts, or like fire a gun out the window, or like do whatever else to try to swing the, the race or the chase or what have you in their favor. And then other characters are, you know, primarily doing backup support, so you know, you can have a guy on like a turret on the top of the car, like swing it, swiveling around and sh firing and using their two actions to throw bananas and shoot or whatever. Um, and then you have like hackers in the passenger seat trying to like hack the smart car in front of them and stuff like that. So similarly, it uh, works kind of the same way in Nebula Chaos. A lot of the stuff that we play isn't like small dogfighting like starships, although you can run those and I have. But typically speaking, you know, you're on like a mid-sized ship and people can, you know, pull up schematics and like try to like pull up jump portals and stuff like that or like shoot the turrets or um, do a number of other things while uh, the guy who's flying the ship and doing spins and stuff is doing his whole thing. Mm -hmm. So, and I would encourage people to play that way too. I, I think there's like certainly it's great to let the pilot have their time in the spotlight. But I also don't think anyone wants to be in a game where we're just watching one guy roll dice the whole time, right? So no, I've, I've, and this isn't a problem that's unique to ship combat because I've had this problem with hacking systems since most the way most parties are going to be set up in a lot of cyberpunk style games. There's one guy who's designated as the hacker. Did I lose you? No, I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just waiting for you. Yeah, but there's usually one guy designated as the hacker, so that when hacking needs to be done, um, everybody's just sitting on their hands while the hacker is while the hacker is engaging in a duet with the GM. You know, I think it depends how you run your games. Um, that can certainly happen, but. Oftentimes, I like the chaos of just having everyone doing everything at once. Um, you know, certainly there are some brief moments where there's like 
just a couple of dice rolls back and forth. I think that's fine. But uh, in Justice Velocity, there was actually this one shot that I played one time where the hacker was um, comfortably on his laptop at a Starbucks while the rest of the party was knee deep in a like gang warfare race down by the docks. Um, and the hacker character would just interject on his turn in combat to see if he could hack, like, the giant crane that was spinning around <laughs> and, like, try to knock people over or, like, hack into the camera systems um, while everyone else is, like, doing their bit in combat and stuff. And that was really fun. That was a really great session. And it was really funny, too, because, like, you know, uh, you know, Shadowrun, I think, struggled with that when... Um, uh, Wi-Fi became more proliferated. <laughs> How it's like, uh, I I don't know if you follow, but like you know, you don't need to like direct in with like an Ethernet cable. So like sometimes they, like <laughs> they yeah. tried they tried to integrate more wireless aspects in, from fourth edition onward. The results have been mixed. Yeah, I mean everything with Shadowrun is a little mixed, but we love it anyway, right? <laughs> Yeah, and the and to be fair, it's me Shadowrun's meant to be a smorgasbord, so you get what you pay for. Yeah, I like Fourth Edition a lot. I think Fourth Edition was pretty good. That's probably the one I played the most. Um, Fifth was cool, but yeah, I think I like the Fourth Anniversary Edition the best. I played a little bit of Second Edition. That was a little dense, uh, to be honest. Like in retrospect, but. some have argued to me that second edition was the peak. I don't see it. <laughs> Maybe um, aesthetically, uh, I don't know about mechanically. It's not a particularly well. You uh, can't play art. <laughs> yeah, right. But like a lot of the support and the modules and stuff like that is really cool. And I, I mean, I think a lot of people just have nostalgia for it, of course, but. And um, I, I could see what people like about it, but yeah, I don't. I, it's not the easiest system to play for sure. I don't play around with nostalgia, oh, because again, you can't. I cannot. I cannot run nostalgia at the table. <laughs> but given given all of that, given all of that, um, how far do you how far do you see the page count going? for Nebula Chaos? Uh, you know, that's a tough question to answer. Um, I think Justice Velocity clocked in at about 80 pages and was, I want to say, like 12,000 words. Um, I think we're trying to keep it under 150 pages. Certainly under 200. Uh, but the current word count right now let me pull it up uh 19.6 thousand so i would say by the time this is published it'll probably be around maybe 23 thousand mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i guess we'll see <laughs> hopefully under 150 um because that's sort of like what our production costs are specced around. Um, and I also like the idea of something that's like, like I said before, quick and easy to read. Because that's a lot of what people liked about Justice Velocity too. is since it is like relatively short, it's one of those games where you can read it in an afternoon and then play it at night kind of thing. And, you know, a lot of the content that we are adding in Nebula Chaos will be kind of like... Uh, you know, like short stories, um, adventure hooks, stuff like that. Like the core rules are still maybe only like 30, 40 pages. Um, but everything else is like tables and lore and advice on running the game and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I can get that. And I will certainly be looking and for art, of course, of course, right? <laughs> of course. Um, and I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my show and enjoy the 
madness that happens around here. Discord likes to cut me off for some reason. Oh yeah, I I wasn't sure if you were just pausing throughout or if, no. what was going on. But... No, I had spo I had spoken, but Discord wants to be weird. Um, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!